Welcome to the Startup Grind. So at this point, I usually do um, a bio and an intro, but I'm going to let the questions handle that tonight. So please give it up for Steve Colton and Brett Blakely of Encore Law. So you guys are going to have to pass this. Okay? All right. Come on, not enough money for two mics? Let's go. So I was really excited to have you guys um, to doing this because I've never been able to uh, copy and paste two, uh, two snapshots of such studs onto the, uh, onto the Startup Grind poster. But okay, so what, I, what, what we need quickly is the Brett Blakely and Steve Colton 101s. Just uh, give it to me. Give me your background, where you came from, why you love golf so much, and how you started this company. Sure. Um, I grew up on Long Island, and... Boo! <laughs> <laughs> Alright, well we only got one mic here, so... Um, but my father was a golfer, and I begged him at 14 years old to get me a set of clubs, and I had to, had to fight him for it, and eventually he got me an old set, and... Um, grew up working at a golf course, Smithtown Landing, public course, you know, pick the range balls. I was the guy out there on the range you were all trying to hit at some point. <laughs> and that was a lot of fun. And, you know, when we were done picking the range, we'd hit golf balls. So I just always had a passion for the game. Um, ended up playing golf at NYU Division III. Uh, most of the school didn't realize we had a golf team, which was <laughs> fine. And my game was pretty much downhill from freshman year on. But uh, it was a ton of fun. And my father was an entrepreneur, so just like Brett's father, Keith, um, I think we both knew we wanted to get into something entrepreneurial. Um, we didn't necessarily know it was going to be golf balls or in Buffalo, um, but the way things shaped up, I'll let Brett kind of touch on that, um, it all came together. Yep. So I am from Buffalo. <laughs> yeah, come on. Yeah. Uh, that means I was born with a hockey stick and a beer bottle right out of the room. That's my mom right there. Let's give it up for Mrs. Blakely. And uh, that's my, my dad too. Shout out to Papa Bucks. There we go. <laughs> but as you can imagine, you know, growing up in this in this city, you develop a appreciation and a love for all things connected and for you know connection with people. Um, I think it drives kind of the passion, and we've tried. And, it's still a lot of that into the, uh, the blood flow of Encore, so that's us. So, I mean, I mean on behalf of everybody in here, and, and on behalf of Buffalo, we couldn't be more excited that, well, you relocated from Long Island, but a born and bred here in Buffalo, it's, a, it's, it's so great for Buffalo, and it's so great for the local golf scene. Uh, and I know that the, the, it is very, very well received um, so we couldn't be more excited that you're here, and especially here tonight. So let's dive in, right? Um, so did you ever think that you would find yourselves building a brand in a sport that you loved while getting to attend events like the Masters and setting up next to John Daly and getting to meet golf superstars and being able to, while at the same time living your dreams, meeting people that you never dreamt you would meet? I don't think anybody plans for that. Um, you know, my father is a serial entrepreneur, and I always, I always had this kind of vision that you know something was going to happen with me. I, I had no idea what it was going to be. I actually did not grow up golfing, so I grew up playing hockey and soccer and basketball and tennis, and uh, I was good at every other sport except for golf because I didn't play enough, and I was too competitive that I didn't want to suck when I went out with my friends. So I just, I said, screw it, you know, whatever. Um, but what I love about it and have grown to love about the sport, I do golf now all the time, playing tomorrow, uh, is the challenge. It's a personal challenge. And what I love about the industry and what got me excited about, you know, Stephen, my opportunity to, to start a company is that it is probably one of the hardest industries you could ever dream of trying to penetrate. And it's because, it's, you know, it's bombarded with five, six, seven billion dollar Goliaths. But the thing that they don't have is, um, they don't have originality, uh, you know, that can't be replicated. And I think, you know, Steve and I have put a focus on making sure that everything we do, uh, the, the whole kind of strategy to move things forward was gonna be unique to us and was gonna bring in a lot of things that are, are 
of personal interest to us. And that, that's what kind of gives us a passion and gives us a drive because people aren't just responding to great products and great golf balls. They're responding to uh, internal, you know, uh, I guess, character traits that we have tried to um, market through Encore Golf. And knowing that they accept that means that they accept us. And it's allowed us to be more confident and really leverage, you know, the differences and uniqueness of ourselves and turn that into a business. Yeah, I, I second that. I don't think we could have planned for where we are today. Um, my father was an entrepreneur, as I mentioned, and he, um, his business was construction. He did the facades of skyscrapers in Manhattan. Um, so I grew up kind of seeing the, the ups and downs of, you know, a usually successful business and then having him basically lose everything. Um, so there's, there's a lot of risk involved in, you know, starting your own business. And I think I've kind of been conservative in that sense and seeing him have everything but have it all taken away. Um, so, and then meeting Keith, um, also being interested in science and technology myself, um, it was pretty impressive, his background in advanced materials and the, the ability to weave science with business, which is really unique. So when you find something like that, you know, it's, we've kind of latched on to his, you know, his success and background and, and tried to, try to make Encore a success. So I guess, I'd like to talk about your productivity. You know, your office is in the Inventors Group, which is right here in the building. Uh, and you're surrounded by other entrepreneurs, you're surrounded by a busy campus, you're surrounded by a lot of activity, sometimes a lot of annoying people when the Wi-Fi goes down. It's like, um, what, are some of the, what are some of the entrepreneurial hacks that you've kind of you know, adopted to stay focused and really get your work done in such a busy environment? Yeah, I think, I think it's just having a healthy lifestyle and you know, working out, eating right, um, trying to be, you know, coming to work in, uh, you know, at, at full spirit and full health and not necessarily anything specific. Um, I think with, with email and communication and social media, we're all kind of inundated with just requests. And I think it's important to make sure that you outline, you know, for the week, for the day, what you need to get done and make sure you get it done as opposed to responding to everyone else and their demands on you. So I know, yeah, I read into productivity and you know, they say with email, you're supposed to, the average amount of time you're supposed to check it is like four, the optimal, and I know I'm probably over 100, so I'm trying to like, <laughs> you know, just, just do things in batches and, and always try to learn, you know, just, just keep reading and, and um, you know, keep growing. He's definitely the one you should listen to on this. <laughs> he is pragmatic, he's logical, he's the implementer, you know, you need... We need the end and the end. Now. Yeah, yeah, he's, you know, he's the organizer. I'm the fly by the seat of your pants, emotionally driven nut job. So, uh, not, neither one is right. Neither one is right at all. Uh, in fact, I would actually recommend that if you are starting a business, you find a partner that is opposite to you because he and I have maybe fought on probably lessen the fingers on my hand, truly. Um, get him angry, I mean, it's, it's like a joke. <laughs> you know, you're like, are you trying to tickle me or are you mad at me? <laughs> um, so, but it, it, it's brilliant because if you had two of me, there'd be dead bodies on the fourth floor and big or none of this would be around because it'd be a murder scene. But, uh, you know, for me, my productivity comes from uh, just being fueled by the passion that people are responding to, to things that have no case studies before them. You know, the, all this is gut instinct for, for the most part. You have to do your research and be prepared. And we try and use and analyze data to make proper decisions and forecast what the ROI is gonna be and everything. But at the end of the day, it's really, you know, a lot of these things and, and methodology and, and the way that we wanna move things forward all has to do with a gut instinct. And the, the brilliant thing for us is that we have, you know, Keith, my father, um, once again, shout out to you. Uh, <laughs> who? Yeah, you can leave. No, get come up here. here. But, um, you know, he he's been a blessing because he's really trusted in us, and not every entrepreneur is going to have that benefit. You're not going to have somebody that can help you, you know, support you financially, uh, your company financially. There's a lot of things that we've been able to do with Encore Golf that, uh, unfortunately, a lot of other entrepreneurs won't have that same um, benefit. That being said. 
there's still a lot that we've done, I think, that we can be really proud of. But what's great is that he trusts in our decisions. And when we say, hey, listen, we want to do this. And, you know, golf's a very traditional sport. So when we tell them these ideas, and it kind of has nothing to do with golf, but has everything to do with golf and awareness, you know, we make it relevant. Um, he doesn't usually question it at all. He just says, if this is what you're thinking, I trust in you. You guys are usually right. And uh, that's, that's a huge benefit for us and allows us a tremendous amount of freedom. So, <clears throat> that was a fantastic answer, by the way. You know, we've never, we rarely do co-founders. So for us to hit that and, and focus on that dynamic right off the bat makes this already worth it for everybody in the room. So thank you. Oh, we're done. Sweet. Thanks. <laughs> that was good. So um, what I'd like to talk about is everybody Everybody here knows about Malcolm Gladwell and the tipping point. Um, so tell me about Encore Golf and your tipping point. Has it happened yet? Was there an aha moment? Uh, to talk about you know the first time that you really felt like, okay, we can do something here. Uh, for me, there's two. Uh, the first one was... Uh, that when we got the USGA conformance letter. So to give you guys some backstory, the first ball that we came out with is, well, it's now called the Caliber. It's got a hollow metal core. It's the most radical departure from golf ball construction in over 30 years. Uh, really nothing like anything the industry had ever seen. We got rejected twice, basically based on the way it looked. It, there was a bunch of ball bigots out there, you know. So uh, we, <laughs> they were ball bigots, man. There was, it was messed up. It was not a good situation. But they were rejecting it based on the differentiation within the construction without even taking a second to test it and realize that it met all the quantifiable metrics. Um, so long story short, we had to battle for you know, a couple of years and uh, we actually had to appeal to the executive standard committee and they were the only committee that could overturn the equipment standard committee. 11 weeks later, I'm in a GNC. All right, general nutrition, whatever, shout out to them. No, I'm joking. Um, Fresh off of work out at lunch, and I get a call from my dad, and he's like, we got the response. I'm like, what is it? And he goes, we got it. We're conforming. I thought there was a 1% chance. So I'm literally in the middle of a GNC, and I'm swearing like a sailor. The people in line had no idea what's going on. They're like, what happened? I go, I think my fucking life just changed. <laughs> so... They were thrilled, you know, for me. And of course, we get back and we're like, all right, this is amazing. What we found out was that we actually became the second company in the history of golf, or at least the last 100 years, to get the USGA to rewrite the rules and allow new technology in. So we knew if we were able to do that, that we actually had a viable business, you know, opportunity here and that things could really change. That was the first aha moment. And I'll try and speed it up. I'm sorry. The second aha moment, yeah, or tipping point, I guess, would be this year when we launched our tour ball, the Elixir. Um, we were able, because of that USGA battle that we won, because we were making history, we recruited two of the best engineers uh, the industry has known. They built the Pro V1, they built all the best balls by Callaway, TaylorMade, they were the main minds behind it. They have, uh, they were pretty much so impressed with what Encore, a little company out of Buffalo, New York, was able to do, and seeing the different in, uh, difference in innovation that they could actually build around, build golf balls around that they gave us a pretty good haircut on what they would normally charge for their services. So they built our latest two balls, and of course when we were having them develop the tour ball, we said, this needs to be the best ball on the planet. In September of last year, we had four versions of it. Uh, by December, we had the best ball on the planet. And it's, um, it's not even close. It's, it's, it's almost a joke that, you know, Titleist and uh, and all these other companies that I probably shouldn't name drop on national TV because then they'll sue us, but um, they spent, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars doing this stuff. And it's because they're confined by in-the-box thinking. They don't look outward and really try and innovate. They don't need to. They've got their marketplace established, whereas we need to make sure that what we're marketing on the box is 100% true. So better be a damn good ball. And every single one of them does what they say. And the Elixir has been something that has propelled us in the stratosphere and been really our, our inflection point. Good job. <laughs> I, would, I would kind of take a little bit of a different approach and say we're just 
you know, near that tipping point. And see, he reins yeah, yeah, my yeah. emotion in. <laughs> I'm like, let's I, go. I, I think I think he's absolutely right about the USGA. We always knew we needed a conforming product. And I think he's right about the elixir being the best ball out there. I just think we need to get that story out. And that's when the tipping point will hit. Mm -hmm. And it's starting to get out there. Feel, I mean, it feels like it's, you know, kind of right upon us. And we're starting to get testimonials from US Open winners and PGA, you know, multiple wins on the PGA Tour Champions Tour saying, you know, that this fall the Elixir will win a major in two to three years. So. Um, that happens, we've definitely hit the tipping point. Yeah. All right, agreed, whatever. <laughs> Debbie Downer, all right. <laughs> so, what, so what I just gathered is that when, and I think this can almost apply to any company or industry, but when you're in, a, in an industry that's dominated by tyrants and uh, golf ball bigots, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, it sounds like some creativity and pure innovation really sets you outside the box, right? So I think that's a lesson we can all take home with us today that applies to creativity. It changes everything and sometimes can change the future of your company. Yep. So with that in mind, um, what, what sort of unique advertising or marketing are you employing right now to be, to, uh, be you know, stepping outside of the box in that regard? And with, also with that in mind, would you label Encore Golf as a disruptor in the industry? Absolutely. Um, we just, Keith came in their office today and said, you know, this patent issue, and it's truly, um, it's the high stiffness um, transition layer patent within the golf ball that basically covers our tour ball and a lot of other things, and we've got a whole suite of patents that are in the process, and. Um, it's pretty insane what we're going to be doing, not only what we've done, but what we've got in the pipeline. So check on the disruption. Um, in terms of the, the marketing, Brett's, you know, um, sales, Brett's marketing, um, so he'll probably speak to that um, a little bit more articulately I'm and kind of eloquently than, than me. Uh, but I think we, we instituted a, a low cost um, trial program that's scalable and we're, we're basically for $3.99, you can go through a ball fitting and try any one of our products um, because we're getting a lot of requests. I'm not gonna buy a dozen until I try a sleeve. So we did this and we're losing money on it just to get the product out there, but we're seeing about 40% repeat customer returns. So, you know, cranking that up, getting it out there, getting people through the fitting and getting the product out there is the best form of marketing because we know the balls perform. Yeah, and, and you know there are things that you can do as a smaller company uh, that big companies can't do. They can't pivot. They're like you know five times the Titanic size ship. Our, our competitors, Titanic and Bridgestone, if they were to redo something or make a pivot in their their strategy, it would take them years to do, and they would lose a lot of customers because for Titleists, they're used to traditional elitist waspy golfers. Sorry if you play Titleists, but that's that's their demographic. We're the middle finger to them. We're the anti-establishment. You know, we are the company that there is a huge demographic of golfers that is completely parched for something that likes to bend the rules, that likes to be a little flashy, likes to add some flair. Um, with the marketing itself, you know, of course we're going after players on the four major tours and we ha we're getting them. Um, you're gonna hear a lot of exciting news about guys on the PGA. We've got web guys playing at LPGA. All that stuff is happening and that adds the, authentic or adds the authenticity and the validation, but we're also really focused right now. I mean, if you guys have been following us, you see, you know, we added a world ranked long drive hitter from Rochester. Personality is out the wazoo. He's a perfect example of don't judge a book by its cover. He's a meathead looking guy, but he's a fine, he's of a fine medical arts degree. He's an inventor. Um, you know, that's the exact type of thing that we're trying to do is we want to empower our audience to leverage the things that make them different rather than be ashamed of them. That's what happened with our golf ball. Instead of changing our golf ball, we stuck with it, we got it approved, and then we made history. Uh, everyone has insecurities, and I am certainly no stranger to that, and we try and use that to our advantage rather than use it as an excuse for failure. But you know, social influencer marketing obviously is huge. Um, we're finally able to bring in some of the, the resources to be able to make that happen. That means 
you know, a social influencer is going to be a professional golfer, but it's also going to be a personality that you'd never expect doing something really cool. Whether it's, you know, Jim Parsons from Big Bang Theory to describe the technology on your golf balls, or 50 Cent, you know, to do a lesson at Chelsea Piers. I mean, it's all about creating a personality, humanizing your company to a point where it's relatable. The reason I swear is not only because I have a filthy mouth in public speaking, but, and I can't help it, I'm passionate, but, um, you know, what I found is, yeah, I probably shouldn't, but at the same time, it disarms everybody and makes them realize that we are all exactly the same. We're all gonna go to Ulrich's and have a beer after this. Everybody's completely accessible, and that's one of the things that we're able to really take advantage of. Title is, you're not gonna get on the phone with Wally Uline, you're not gonna go to Ulrich's for a beer with the president of Nike, but you will with us. And so as big as we grow and as much as, you know, we, uh, success as we obtain, we want to always make sure that we're bringing our, our audience on a journey with us um, because we're extremely fortunate to be in the position we are and we want them to feel like they are just as much a part of the decision making and uh, a part of this whole movement that we're trying to create. Okay, so this question is actually for Steve, so why don't you hand the mic over, big mouth. Oh, man. And, uh, okay, so Steve, you have volunteered in some very exotic places around the world. And, you know, uh, it's, it's very similar with my sister. She volunteered and visited Africa a number of times and was driven to help anybody she can in the, on that continent. So, um, with that in mind and your experience volunteering all over the world, how has that driven your entrepreneurial spirit? And, uh, and, and you know, just tell us about how it's driven you to be where you are today. I think you know, any time we hit a tough patch you know, with our company, I'm, I'm taken back to my time in Cambodia working with um, orphans over there. And it's just, it lights a fire in me in terms of the passion they had um, the intensity to learn English, to grow. Cambodia um, was on par with Singapore, their economy, um, at one point in the 60s until Pol Pot came in and there was a mass genocide. Basically targeted anyone with an education, with glasses on, teachers, anyone with the former political regime. So the country was decimated and they're starting over. So it was, you know, just, I think, it made me realize it's a big world out there and we're so fortunate here um, just to have the things we have and you know little things like hot water you take a shower it's like wow well, you know you just take that for granted but over there it's it's a luxury and so I, I it's inspiring and I hope we can make Encore a big success so we can help out and, and give back in the community great answer this This question is for Brett. Brett, you can answer this one. Okay. <laughs> um, tell me why, uh, you, know, you know, Encore chose the Buffalo ecosystem to call home. That is very easy. Um, so growing up in Buffalo, we all probably, if you, if you guys are all from Buffalo, have felt the pride, and it's all because of what I talked about in my first opening bit here. Uh, my monologue, if you will. Um, you know, it's, it's connection. Buffalo is a city of connection. Uh, everybody is one degree of separation away. It makes it hard when you're dating. But, um, <laughs> hey, she's great. Did you know, did you hear what she was like in high school? Okay, it's not going so well anymore. So that's the downfall. But, um, you know, for me, I, I moved to New York in 2006 uh, to 2009. And this is before all the, the reinvigoration and the kind of the renaissance of Buffalo, if you will. And even then, I mean, you can ask Steve, we'd be at McFadden's for Bill's, you know, the Bill's Backer Bar in New York every Sunday, and they call me the mayor because you'd run into Buffalonians that you know or what have you, and it's, it was just, you get homesick right away, so it's like a place for you to not feel homesick. And that is, Everywhere I've gone in the world, it's like you always see somebody from Buffalo, and I love that. And I remember we were trying to raise money early on, and there was a group in Florida that said, I'll give you the whole financial raise you're looking for, but you got to have a headquarter office, you got to move it down here. Guess what we did? No. So that's why we're here. 
It was that important because part of the encore story is an underdog story. It's a David versus Goliath, we're using golf balls, not rocks. Um, but Buffalo has been, you know, the, uh, the subject of, I guess, uh, unwarranted abuse and negativity. So every time something positive happens, we're extremely proud of it. And what I love is that an opportunity here to, to rally a group of a, a city like Buffalo around a company like ours and have them really believe in it. Well, for one, Buffalonians are everywhere. We're like the damn zombie plague. You, you will find us with a beer in hand somewhere in a world destination near you. I guarantee it, you can't escape it. So what's great is, you know, having that kind of passion behind our company, uh, it all starts from home. So for this to be a huge success, you need a community like Buffalo that's going to care as much as they do and be as selfless in promoting other things that bring positivity. Uh, so, I mean, there's just no chance that we're going to Carlsbad, California, where all the other companies are, and sure as hell no chance we're going to Massachusetts, where Titleists are, you know, Buffalo is encore country, and that's what we want, you know, the whole world to know, but it all starts from here and, and the people that live in it. I want to hit you. I want to hit you with a couple of quick ones. Okay. <clears throat> What's the longest drive with an encore ball to date? It's still in the air. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> Come on, give him a round of applause. Uh, what is the longest drive? A Steenberg. Oh, yeah. Steenberg. Yeah. Uh, uh, somewhere between the four sixties. Four sixties. Yeah. Four sixties. Yeah. Wow. yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wasn't, unfortunately, that wasn't an encore ball, I won't lie. That was, because uh, that was Golf Channel, and that was, they are sponsored by Volvic, um, but they both suck. And, uh, <laughs> and they were in Denver, it was thin air, you know, so they got a little benefit. No, but our guy, he's going to be the one that sets that record, but I think he's probably hit ours about 465, 475. Wow. And what is your favorite golf course locally? Go ahead. I like Greg Burn, and it's, it's like, yeah. Uh, God's country for, for golfers there. I mean, I, I've only played the front nine there, but hopefully we'll, we'll get a corporate membership someday. <laughs> <laughs> Money bags. <laughs> um, God. You know, I have, so I, I literally just kind of really picked up the sport passionately. Um, I always loved the atmosphere of, but like I said, growing up, I didn't play it. So I've been playing a lot of, you know, the cheap courses with Steve for him to get me some, uh, some lessons and everything. But I did get a chance, it's not totally local. I got to play in the Pro-Am a couple weeks ago for a web.com event uh, that we sponsored. It was uh, Peak and Peak. And that was not, not my favorite course I've been to, even though it was beautiful. We've seen a lot of great ones for celebrity tournaments and everything. But uh, I've never hit off grass that didn't have dandelions sprouting off of it. It was, it was like, <laughs> felt. Okay, now in your, I think we, I think we can call it a professional opinion, right? Um, Depends what you're asking. <laughs> uh, what do you think the Western New York golf scene needs more of? <laughs> Mama Blakely. Yeah. Yeah, that would, that would work, definitely. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. I, there was a proposal to turn Delaware Park into like a Jack Nicholas championship course and I actually thought it was a bad idea because I think with Delaware Park you've got a lot of African American golfers there. It's affordable. We play a lot of golf there. It's in the city. Um, so supporting the city courses that you know are accessible for people and, and making the game more accessible. Um, bringing in more juniors and I think with Jordan Spieth out there you know, rocking it, um, winning the U.S. Open, and a lot of kids will get inspired, and hopefully Brett and I, with our involvement in the first tee, um, we can bring more juniors into the sport, but, um, so I would say, yeah, more initiatives to make it more accessible, and getting clubs out in the yeah. hands of, the, of kids in these communities. Yeah. My answer, if anybody cares, is that I think Western New York needs more dog-friendly golf courses. Love it. Yeah. So I live right by Delaware Park, and I bring my sandwich and my dog and three balls, and I'm out there for an hour and a half just playing around, and my dog gets all the exercise he needs, and it's wonderful. I love it. So um, one more question. Do you think Jordan Spieth is going to win the Grand Slam this year? I mean, he, 
he's a beast. What do you do, birdie, birdie, eagle, birdie? And you, he's crazy. I mean, he's a sick mother. <laughs> um, yeah, he's, he's pretty good. But what, what I think, uh, do it, is he gonna win? The, oh man, that's tough. If I was a betting man, I'd say yes. Yeah, I think he's got a great, <clears throat> excuse me, I think he's got a great job. Saving my part. Yeah, thanks, man. Appreciate it. I think I think this is the year for Jordan. Yeah, he's he's got as good a chance as anyone. Um, but there's a lot of talent out there. But we'll see. Okay, so this question is a segue. Where can one buy Encore golf balls? Got them taped under your seats right now. <laughs> uh, we got them in all the pro shops locally, pretty much Wegmans. Um, Pro shops around the country, you can get them online. We've got free sleeves on your way out. Um, we've got a card there for 40% off your first purchase. You can come see us up in the office. Um, we're, we're there, we're accessible. Brett would love to um, have a beer with you in the office. I was gonna do the whole Oprah thing, you know. <laughs> you get a sleeve, you get a sleeve, you all get sleeves. <laughs> so that's the truth of it. You guys all get sleeves. We hopefully brought enough for the amount of attendees here, but um, it is our new tour ball, so enjoy the hell out of it. It's phenomenal. Uh, but we, uh, yeah, we're in everything from pro shops to all 92 Wegmans across the Northeast Coast. We have 34 national reps. We're sold in over 20 countries. Uh, so just ask and you shall find. All right. And I want to get back to, to Wegmans, but there's one quick question that I left out. If you could have any golfer of all time be the official golfer of Encore Balls, who would it be? We've always said Ricky Fowler would be a perfect fit for us. Yep. And he may be in need of a golf ball soon. I don't know. He's a, he's a trendsetter. You know, he, he, is, he embodies everything that we've tried to do from a company standpoint, but he did it on a personal level. Part of that is Cobra Puma is a brand. They're very colorful and unique. I mean, Ricky was the first to rock a flat brim. He was the first to bring a little urban flair into the game of golf that was so non-urban. Um, you know, we're all about growing the game and society through diversity and acceptance and differences. So uh, to be a trendsetter like that and have him matched up with a, a company like ours that um, uses that kind of mentality as its focal point, uh, he would be unbelievable. He'd be unbelievable, yeah. I agree. I think that'd be a perfect fit for you, considering how unconventional you've been in your approach to the game of golf. Mm -hmm. Now, just by a show of hands, everybody here, um, besides Encore, who or what golf ball, who has seen a golf ball in Wegmans? Besides Encore. Oh, never. Oh. Right. Never. Right. So let's talk about that. Yeah. <clears throat> First of all, my question is how, because that's amazing, and why Wegmans? So Wegmans, uh, so Ryan Steenberg, our, our long drive guy, he, uh, he actually owns his own gym and trains some of the best young golfers uh, in the country. But he also trains two or three of the top executives at, at, uh, at Wegmans. So they had talked to him about how they wanted to expand their products and get into things other than just food, specifically golf balls. And he said, well, have you tried the Elixir? Of course he said, no, we haven't. Um, so they, they went out and played around and uh, just like, listen, I, I know that we own the company. I would tell you it's the best ball ever even if it wasn't. I'm telling you it's the best ball ever even if I didn't work or have anything to do with Encore. This thing is crazy. Uh, and they, they literally, they played around with it and they thought, this is insane. We want premium products to offer at a discounted price to our, uh, you know, to our uh, membership. So. Um, long story short, they were the ones that came to us and said, we want to put you in all 92 stores across the entire Northeast. And for us, this is exactly, it's so Encore. I mean, it really is, you know, you talk about a blue ocean strategy and doing things differently. We like to play in sandboxes that nobody else plays. We see value in having a social influencer that doesn't play golf, but maybe has a huge personality. We see the value in you know having our golf balls in a grocery store um, where others might be like, why on earth would I do that? You play in sandboxes, others aren't, and then you have no competition. And Wegmans is ours and ours alone. That's a $17 billion company basically you know, co-signing your brand. Not a bad gig. 
We'll add to that. Shout out to my girlfriend, Judy, because <laughs> three or four years ago, she suggested that, she said, why don't you talk to Wegmans about selling a golf ball? So I went, um, she got me the email of the buyer, and it was the Avant ball. So in six of the eight local stores, they agreed to stock it. And so we put an innovation born in Buffalo on the Avant golf ball, and it did pretty well. So I think... You know, as Brett mentioned, there was, you know, Steenberg and the executives were hearing about it. There was the Costco Kirkland ball that's a competitor to Wegmans that was doing really well out there in the market. So you had this confluence of things happening. There was probably a press release in Rochester about John Cuomo, and our investors joining the team. Um, so I think you, you marry all those things together and it just, it, it just happened. And so thank you for, for that idea. I think it helped expedite the Elixir sale. Way to go, Judy. Nice job, Judy. <laughs> okay, I have, I have one more kind of a deep dive question, and then I'm gonna ask you to pick three questions from our list of 11 over there that we collected during the networking hour, and then we're gonna allow two or three questions from the audience, is that cool? Yeah. Okay, so my last question for you is as follows. If you are out there hosting or attending long drive competitions, soliciting endorsements, talking to the pros, talking to CEOs and investors, attending the PGA Tour events, the Masters, the biggest events in golf, and you're really applying yourself to no end, blood, sweat, and tears into, this, into these events. The events eventually come to an end. So how do you turn short-term activity into long-term success? Great job on that question. You really built the suspense there. <laughs> Good one. Did you remember it all? Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, uh, I think, um, you know, at, at events, we, you can get overwhelmed with, you know, the quantity of people at some of these golf tournaments, the waste management. We went, we went there was a couple hundred thousand people through the doors a day. So I think we both always try to focus on quality over quantity and just making connections with people and not worrying about trying to touch, you know, every person that's there. Um, and I usually keep a notebook with me just to jot down, you know, any potential leads, you know, any interesting conversations and, and make sure that we follow up with them. Um, anything to add, bud? Sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, networking obviously is always going to be a no-brainer everywhere you go you should be contact and communicating and telling your story, telling your company's story. Uh, but again, going back to kind of what I spoke about in the beginning, it's all about connection and relationships. Uh, theory of reciprocity is a real thing and it's very effective. Um, not to use it in an inauthentic way, but when you develop a rapport and a relationship with people that can help accelerate your business, which we have an opportunity every time we do some of these big tournaments, and not always the celebrity tournaments. In fact, a lot of times the biggest connections come from non-celebrity tournaments. But, uh, you know, developing a relationship with um, these celebrities so that you can call on them when you're ready to have them and use them at your disposal. Instead of maybe charging you 50 grand, maybe they charge you five. Maybe there's no charge at all. Uh, so it's basically just making sure you take advantage of every opportunity to tell your story and to get people enamored with you. They can love the product, but if they love you, uh, everything comes easier because there's a million products that they probably love and there's a million products especially with people that have been successful or celebrities that they get pitched on. What's going to make the difference between them saying, yeah, I'll do something for them or for them. It's going to be, oh, well, I can't remember that guy's name or, yeah, let me call Brett. I'm going to let him know right now. Um, Anthony Anderson is, is one example. We did a tournament of his in May. Uh, he's on, you know, the show Blackish. He's a yeah, big celebrity. So he, he's awesome. He's golfing with Barack Obama the other day. Uh, and uh, of course, he is still playing the golf ball, the elixir that I introduced him to when we did his celebrity tournament two months ago. And the guy who was out there, John Guyberger, Al Guyberger's son, Al Guyberger is a famous golfer who shot the first 59 ever. Um, and John, so he's talking to John about the ball and he says, yeah, this is, this is the encore guys. He goes, oh, you know, you know them? I know the founders in my tournament. It's that type of stuff, though, where you're like, all right, you know, yeah, that's the stuff you never dream of. 
but everybody is exactly the same. They all put on underwear, they all put on shoes, they all take them off, they all shower. So it's just about making sure that every opportunity you have to interface with somebody that could potentially accelerate your business, you take full advantage. And you take advantage of the ones that may not have, uh, at, at first glance, an opportunity to accelerate, accelerate your business then, but you don't dismiss it because they might be uh, 10 times more successful than you the next year. Um, so again, it's just about creating those relationships. And golf is very much a relationship industry. Do you think sure. uh, Mr. Obama hit the ball? I hope so. I hope so. I think he would. Uh, I think he'd love it. He'd say, "You know, that ball, that ball is great. <laughs> that ball, it goes far, and uh, you know, Bo loves me some elixir. That's what he'd say. I'm telling you." <laughs> You got pick? Okay, what were the biggest obstacles you struggled with and how did you overcome them? Um, for us, it's probably the USGA battle uh, initially and overcame by persistence. Um, a lot of hard work from my father actually and legal teams and uh, the engineers putting together a, an argument that would overcome an impossible task. Um, other than that, obstacles for me personally are probably trying to remove the emotion out of things. I get very high when things go well and I get very low when things go poorly. And that's one of the things you learn uh, very early. Uh, success is not going to happen overnight. Patience is not a virtue of mine. So that was, <laughs> that was tough to, uh, to accept. But if you can keep yourself somewhat even keeled and balanced and um, try and take, remove some of the emotion, it's good at some points, but um, that's what I have Steve for. He's the one that, you know, when the world's burning, he calms me down. And uh, when I'm ready to set the world on fire, he's the one that takes the match away. <laughs> Great answer. I love how you just went up there and just winged it. Didn't even look. Uh, five, I think. For me, I, I lost my father early on in life, um, going into my sophomore year in college, so he's the one who got me into golf, and that was a big, big blow. So dealing with that was tough, but again, it's you know something that I use as inspiration and passion because of his fire and his entrepreneurial ability. Um, so it, you, gotta, you gotta turn an obstacle um, you know, and, and do a positive. I like, um I like number eight. How did you prove that tech works? Keith, can you answer that? Technology. Um, so we do robotic testing um, with our, you know, with all of our golf balls. Um, fortunately, we have the best engineers in the world designing the balls, um, and they started with the hollow core concept, this notion of perimeter weighting, um, which would cut down on your slice, which is another question if anyone wants to get up here and show us their swing. Um, so we have, you know, Brett and I have confidence in, in the engineering team. Um, you know, he, Brett had a, a great, we were talking about new developments for balls, and he framed it, I thought, perfectly. He said, what's the innovation? And when you ask that question, it helps guide you, you know, we're not just gonna build another ball for the sake of building another ball. Um, there's gotta be something innovative about it um, because we're not just a marketing company slapping a logo on a new golf ball. We're really about innovation and technology. All right, I want to do number seven quickly because I think it's a yes or no question. Can you fix any slices in here? I'll say it in three languages. Yes, see, we. <laughs> okay, and then I think this question is very applicable because there's a lot of entrepreneurs in here and a lot of us de deal with time management. Um, so, where did it go? Number 10. How have you balanced Encore Golf with your life? Do you have any tips for time management? Um, I'm, I'm fortunate because as sporadic and ADDHD as I am, um, I can't allow myself to sit in one place for too long. Uh, but also, I mean, I think for me it's about balance. And of course, that's in the question. But as an entrepreneur, you're going to be on calls at 6 p.m., at 8 p.m., at 10 p.m. 
not every day, but it happens. Uh, so it's just about finding you know the things that you're really passionate about and making sure that you uh, insert those into your schedule and your priorities. I love photography, so uh, for me, you know, taking my dog out, putting my headphones on, listening to some nice cold play, you know, or romantic, you know. Um, that kind of stuff for me is what balances everything out. And uh, I mean, Steve is so balanced. I mean, he's, he's practically floating like a Hindu monk right now. It's <laughs> quite the setup, man. Yeah. On that note, I do, I do meditate. Um, it helps. And yeah, I, I think I second those comments. Keeping hobbies. Um, I, I practiced Italian. I, I studied abroad um, during college in Florence. And, I just love the language, love the culture. So, you know, I try to try to do things that are outside of golf, so we're not, you know, we don't get burnt out. Um, so, that would, my advice would be to just, you know, make sure you maintain your hobbies and, and have fun and bring bring games, bring joy into your life. All right. Let's, any questions out here? Yep, in the back. We have both, but that's not the one we're showing. So you're actually going to see our latest commercial now. The one he's referencing, though, is really cool because the whole concept was to be a commercial that nobody in the industry had ever seen before. It was all animation. These guys, you know, work on films and everything. We wanted to, in 30 seconds, explain uh, the innovation in not one, not two, but three different golf balls. Do it effectively, but also make it, like you said, very eloquently badass. Um, so we did, and we worked with a great company, and, and when that came on, what was really cool actually is before that came on, we went to the PGA show, and we got to show it to uh, not only, you know, consumers and, and just regular people, but we got to show it to industry experts. Um, do you guys know who Mike Collins is? He's kind of a heavy set guy, he's on ESPN, he does all the golf commentary, he's absolutely hilarious. We've got a picture on our Instagram from back, back in January where he has the headphones on, he's watching it for the first time, and he goes, I mean, he's like a little kid. Like, he, you know, he went from whatever he is, 45, 50 or whatever, to two years old. Everybody that saw it, they're like, he, and he said, and I quote, that's some transformer shit right there. That's fucking nuts. I'm like, I know, man, I told you. Uh, we had a guy who works for Srixon, you know, come over and he watched it, and the whole point was exactly what we wanted. We wanted to, it was an untested theory because every golf commercial you see is a guy, you know, on a fairway hitting a ball. And you can do that, but we wanted to go with something that showed off the flair and something that if you had never heard of Encore and you saw a commercial on Golf Channel, you were going to think it was a movie trailer. And you would say, I don't know what I just saw, but damn, let me rewind that and let me find out about it. Sometimes the end goal is not to promote the product, it's to promote promote the originality and promote the differentiation, get them excited about that. Again, it's about, you know, capturing an emotion, evoking an emotion, and then latching on to it and never letting go. And that's why I think a lot of the people that follow on for it, it's like a call like following, you know, that anything that we put on the market, they're just like, yep, let's go, let's eat it up, let's do it. So that was, it was pretty cool though. Actually, it's pretty mm, awesome. <laughs> I think the commercial was badass and, and we loved it, but a dream of Brett and, our, and mine has been, always been to have golfers out there playing you know, our, our golf balls and winning tournaments. So as cool as the Masters commercial was, I think when we have you know, horses in the race, we've got guys out there um, representing Buffalo and Encore Golf and in contention, it's gonna be a whole new level and that's, that's really what gets me excited. We got one more and then we'll watch the commercial. We recently partnered with the LPGA. Um, we've got a great the Avant ball, so it's low compression, really good for slower swing speeds, females, seniors, and they wanted us to use that ball to launch a partnership with their foundation. We're donating proceeds of golf ball sales back to the foundation. They also have girls golf initiatives throughout the country, so um, we're supporting those as well. Cindy Miller locally. The dress code? Yeah, sure. We're we're gonna dress. Uh, I'm gonna 
female clothes and, and shriek at the master. No, I don't. Um, I haven't actually gotten into the, the nuts and bolts of that decision. Um, I know I've heard people say, you know, it's a good decision, kind of more of the conservative golfers and then some of the women who were just like, what the hell are they doing? Um, but, but how do you feel about it? Yeah, second that. Well, and one of the cool things is we actually just, you know, we've been talking about trying to reach out more to um, the female demographic. And uh, there's a, a girl, you can look her up on YouTube, and you've probably seen her on Facebook already. Her name's Tanya Taylor. I think it's T A N I A T A R E. Yeah, Tanya Taylor. She's from New Zealand, lives in LA. She is a totally viral trick shot artist who's actually trying to compete and make the LPGA as well. But talk about badass, <laughs> this girl has, she has more swag than P. Diddy in 1991, I'm telling you. She is killing it, throwing the club over her hand, you know, doing everything you can imagine. So what, what's really interesting about that though is that Bridgestone and Sritzon, who are two of the Goliaths, uh, were trying to sign her too. Guess who she chose? It was us, and it's because she loved the ball, it's because with us, she is a star. She's one of one. She's not one of 10,000. Um, so she sees her, you know, an opportunity to accelerate her own brand, but also accelerate her influence on girls' golf. And the biggest thing that I love about her, there are a lot of companies that use uh, women in a very, I don't know, I, I don't want to say a, a negative way, but it's more about their assets than their golf game. And what's great about Tommy is that, yes, she's beautiful, but she is a strong, kick any guy's ass type of golf girl that you could imagine. So it's not going to be a, you know, sexually driven campaign with her. It's going to be this whole thing is meant to help empower the girls that the LPGA partnership was meant to start and ignite. And I think she's going to be a great face for it. And again, if she makes the LPGA. That's lightning in a bottle. That's a great, you know, that's a great story for us. Oh, so before you start this, let me just give you some backdrop. Um, so this is really fun to do. It was a couple months ago. We're revamping our website, and there's uh, for you know the tech geeks um, out there. And I say geeks lovingly. I love you guys. Um, we're using HTML5, which is going to be a video homepage rather than a static image. And so we wanted to do something that was going to be really engaging. That in 30 seconds would show off all three of our golf balls. Would have no narration, but still get a point across and make you want to find out more. So this kid's name is Kyle Harmon. He's actually going to be coaching. Um, Damon, which is D2 this year, uh, he played the Elixir first time competitively, was it a week ago at the US Open Amateur, um, and qualified, which I mean, he hasn't played competitively in years. He said the ball literally saved him on three of the holes. So he's headed to Beth Page Black, which is one of the hardest uh, courses out there. But what's cool about this video, it's gonna look like slow motion. What it actually is, is 12 frames per second photography Took about six, seven hours. We put them in our all white outfit, all black and all red. And then we had to edit everything together to make it look like a slow motion video. Thanks for that backdrop, brother. Sorry. <laughs> Good to go? I just got to enlarge it. That was amazing. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Mike might be broken, so we're going to move over to this yeah. one. <laughs> Sorry, I get so um, amped. It's we time for one more question. Yeah. So, let's start back to when you were in your younger days, when you just formed this company. How did you guys get things like assembled together? So, for example, I'm a solopreneur, and it's very difficult to be on your own at a very infantile stage where you're kind of engaging like, you know, am I building the widget before I should be testing it? Or did you test it with area golfers? Did you guys do it in college? How did you guys you know, start in that area? 
Yeah, I think we we were a little green um, when we started. We were talking about owning an island next to Richard Branson and you know, you know flying private jets, and we we bounced our first check. So it was kind of a wake up call. Um, but you gotta, you just gotta fight through it. And you gotta learn, um, you know, through through the hard times, and that's that's the only way you can grow. I don't think you know it ever starts out out of the gate um, a success. It's rare, and we've you know we may have been a little premature with our first golf ball, um, trying to make a great beginner ball, a ball for everyone, uh, because we wanted it, everyone to try it, and I think we learned that um, you know that probably was a little premature, but. But yeah, the, you know, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. So we're always looking forward, but you know, trying to learn from things that you know, mistakes we've made, things that we could have done better. Yeah, one. Well, I mean, again, I, I told you, patience isn't a virtue of mine. So our first uh, first time ever that the ball was played in public, we fell back asswards into a PR company. Um, this girl Karina and a uh, guy Kurt. Uh, and they've been with us ever since. And they needed a ball sponsor for Ruben Brown's celebrity tournament, and it was in Anguilla. If you've never heard or been to Anguilla, wow, it's paradise. So I get a call, and uh, she says, you know, hey, I heard that you guys are in the golf ball business. Any interest in being the ball sponsor? You guys will get to come. You're saying 5,000 a night bill is for free. We're hanging with Warren Sapp and Gary Payton and everything. So I'm like, we're in. I haven't even made a ball yet. So I call my dad and I'm like, listen, I don't care what happens. I got to go on this trip. You need to get balls in like two weeks. Not only that, but you actually, it's actually out of the country. You have to fly into what, St. Vincent, and you, have, you need your passport. You're on the Dutch side. So I'm thinking when we're at the airport, shit, we've got, a, we've got golf balls for about 145, you know, 150 players. They're going to put these things through an x-ray, and there's going to be a hollow steel core. They're going to think we're drug smugglers. All the products can be destroyed, and I'm going to be end up, you know, Jose's boyfriend. And I'm like, I'm screwed. So I, I had no idea what was going to happen, and it was, um, but it was, it was great. We went there, and we had the time of our lives. And Steve and I, legitimately, we thought, we were like, well, that was easy. Started a company like a month ago. And here we are, you know, I'm freestyle rapping at 5 in the morning with Warren Sapp, no joke. They still send me the video to this day, it's epic, because I killed it. Um, it's a hidden talent of mine. True story, I will flow the crap out of this thing. Oh, it's great. But, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, like, everything that we thought was going to happen quicker didn't. Every, every time that something went wrong, I was the one to overreact and... A year later, you know, it will go right. When you asked about seeding the marketplace, we spent probably two years where all our, we would get maybe 100 to 300 dozen in, and that was it. And that would last for two to three months, just getting it out in local golfers' hands, getting feedback. It wasn't like we were just gung-ho, let's go, let's order 10,000 dozen and figure out a way to sell them. We had to get feedback. But what happens is everything that went wrong that I got angry about, a year later, that was rectified and things went well. And I realized that we weren't ready for it to go right before. A year prior when I was all upset, if it had gone correctly and everything went smoothly, it would have been a year premature. So it's, it's part of the way that I think you can deal with, you know, the ups and downs of uh, being an entrepreneur is not getting over deflated when something goes wrong because trust me, the timing probably wasn't right, you just didn't Maybe it was your ego, maybe whatever, um, just to recognize it. And when it goes right, it was meant to go right at that time. And then you got to absolutely make sure you take full advantage of it.